Greetings from Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I hope this video finds you well wherever you are in the world. And once again, warmest regards to you, and please continue to stay safe during these times. Continuing with my discussion of the works of John Carpenter, please allow me, if I may, to talk to you about some thoughts that I have with respect to the film that John Carpenter directed in 1995. And it is a uh, film starring Christopher Reeve and Kirstie Alley. It is quite a shocker of a film with a lot of impact. And it's my great pleasure and honor to be able to talk to you today about this film. Village of the Damned. have another film by John Carpenter uh, with uh, Universal and we also have a film that is a kind of remake of a film that was made in 1960 and also a reinterpretation in a way or a another adaptation into film of the underlying work by John Wyndham, uh, The Midwich Cuckoos. Uh, so we have the underlying work from 1957 and then the, the film, Village of the Damned, uh, the Wolf Rilla film uh, from 1960 starring George Sanders. And then we have uh, fast forward until 1995 where we have the film released by John Carpenter, Village of the Damned. This film is described by John Carpenter in the supplements here to be a kind of work for hire in the sense that uh, he was uh, looking for a project and Universal uh, were trying to uh, uh, sort of maybe jumpstart this particular property or try to do something with it and uh, they found John Carpenter and the script was by uh, David uh, Himmelstein and Sandy King uh, was coming on to produce as well and so uh, all the circumstances fell into place for John Carpenter to direct this film again according to the supplements here and we have as I say a remake of sorts that is not uh, wholly uh, dissimilar to the uh, to the situation that John Carpenter found himself when he was tackling the the work that ended up becoming the film The Thing. Uh, so we have here Village of the Damned in a similar kind of situation. Uh, I would uh, also say that Village of the Damned is a a, a very sharp Carpenter work. And granted, I think uh, John Carpenter and Sandy King and others uh, are, suggest in the supplements that uh, on the one hand, uh, Carpenter was uh, probably not uh, directly involved in the entirety of the post-production finish of the film. And so perhaps the final product is not wholly representative of Carpenter's true vision as the director of the piece. However, Carpenter also expresses his his sort of uh, satisfaction uh, with the work that he was involved with in the film and the cast and crew and the story as well and even when looking at the final product I think it is as I say very sharp very vicious and uh, it has a a real raw kind of edge to it that is uh, quite disturbing and very intense in places. However, this intensity is presented on screen in a very 
carpenter-esque type of way uh, so as not to be overly gratuitous with the violence, uh, show us just enough to present to us the horror and the menace and the threat of this particular situation, but also generate enough suspense and tension uh, with uh, the cinematic tools uh, at his disposal that he has been um, employing throughout his entire career up to now as the cinematic artist that he is. And so this is a, a really a great uh, carpenter work, in my opinion. Very disturbing, very chilling, very eerie, and ultimately very effective. This is Village of the Damned. And the Scream Factory, Shout Factory release here, the Blu-ray, uh, is a Region A Blu-ray, but it is uh, really fantastic. And uh, if you are a fan of John Carpenter works and or if you are a fan of John Carpenter's Village of the Damned, this is a, a must get. Uh, really, really great. Uh, we have the film itself. Uh, granted, there is no commentary track on this particular release as far as I can tell. Uh, so this is a little bit unlike other John Carpenter films that have been released by Shout Factory, Scream Factory, uh, in that most of those others were uh, accompanied by commentary tracks. This has none, so uh, that's a little bit of a shame. It's always nice to hear John Carpenter speak uh, with someone, uh, Sandy King or, or Peter Jason or who, whomever, but uh, uh, that is not, uh, that's, that's still okay as far as this release is concerned, my friends, because there is a documentary, a new documentary Documentary, which is called It Takes a Village, making of John Carpenter's Village of the Damned. This is about 50 minutes, 5 0, 50 minutes long, and it goes through a lot. We have interviews given by John Carpenter himself, Sandy King, Greg Nicotero. And also we have uh, some of the other stars who played some of the the children here. Uh, so we have Thomas Decker who played David, and we have uh, Lindsay Hahn who played um, uh, who played uh, uh, Mara. And so uh, those are the two sort of main uh, uh, children parts uh, of this film. The the two main children characters here, and then we have other uh, other. Of the uh, actors who played the children. So Cody Dorkin, uh, Danielle Keaton uh, is also featured. And then we have other actors uh, talking, uh, Meredith Salinger and uh, Karen Kahn, uh, Peter Jason, and uh, Michael uh, Pere. And uh, so we have a whole range of, of interviews given, and it's a really insightful, in-depth uh, uh, documentary and so the fact that there is no commentary track for this is still okay because we have this great documentary uh, we, we have these uh, actors and crew talking once again about working with John Carpenter and, and how he is in many ways an actor's director he respects the actors he gives them space and gives them room to grow and to develop the characters and uh, so it, it turns out to be a very artistically satisfactory uh, project from the point of view of the actors concerned. They also speak about the uh, the other actors who uh, were featured. Uh, in particular, they speak of Christopher Reeve and his particular performance here and how he gave a lot of emotional intensity to the role and uh, how uh, his uh, he, he forms the uh, he forms the emotional core of the film in many respects because everything uh, is revolving more or less around him and also around the Linda uh, Koslowski character as she also forms a, a, a real uh, center to this film uh, because uh, of her relationship with her son and also um, uh, the Christopher Reeve character's relationship with uh, her his daughter and also the community around them and so uh, it's, it's, it's just a great thing to, to hear about. And also there's uh, also uh, 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 mentionings, of course, of the other key actors in the film. Christy Alley, who plays a very key role in the film. Mark Hamill, who also plays a very key role in the film. Unfortunately, they don't appear in this documentary per se, but they are uh, spoken of in very uh, warm and glowing ways. Uh, and so it, it's really wonderful to hear, especially uh, hearing Carpenter speak about them. Uh, it's, it's nice to hear that. 
And uh, we also have Meredith uh, Salinger, who plays the character of Melanie, Melanie Roberts in the film. And her role is also a very crucial role. And it's also he good to hear her talk about working with Carpenter. And, and, and there's one particular story that she talks about where uh, uh, John Carpenter, she had to act afraid and she had to act startled in a particular scene early on in the film. And it was very interesting and, and almost funny to hear her recount the story about how John Carpenter was trying to uh, elicit a reaction from her. And uh, it, it was, uh, it, to, it, you should listen to the that story if you haven't already. It's really great. Um, and uh, there are, um, there are also mentions by uh, Carpenter about uh, this film and also the earlier film and working with the script and how he wanted to uh, add things to the underlying script to make it more in line with, let's say, the, the uh, Wolf Rilla 1960 film. And uh, there's a lot of respect that he has for the, the earlier 1960 work in Wolf Rilla himself. And we find out later that, uh, in fact, the, the director, Wolf Rilla, in fact, visited the set. Uh, and, and not only that, John Carpenter actually invited him and his wife to visit the set, uh, to visit the location and the, the production site, uh, which was in Northern California. And so uh, uh, that, that really shows uh, the, the kind of... Uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, respect that John Carpenter has for the underlying work. And indeed, the film itself is, uh, there are many things that are very similar to, uh, for instance, the 1960 film itself. So uh, it's, but there are some interesting twists to it as well, but still it maintains a kind of respectful, uh, respectful uh, uh, approach to the uh, original uh, underlying work. Um, and also, it's nice to hear John Carpenter in this documentary talk about other uh, cinematic uh, traditions. And we've seen John Carpenter in his past works deal with uh, cinematic traditions and early classic Hollywood cinema. Here he mentions the use of the wide uh, frame and trying to capture the majesty of the background and the the, the environment and the nature uh, in, in this expanse of uh, of these uh, this small town, uh, basically isolated from uh, from sort of an urban environment, and it's in its in its in its, in its own uh, natural setting, as it were. It's a very quiet small town, and he mentions the framing of certain shots, and he mentions uh, it reminded him almost of John Ford and how John Ford would would shoot the the wide expanse. And I really love that. I love how he mentions John Ford in this. Uh, it's almost like uh, he is, again, channeling that, uh, that classical Hollywood tradition. Uh, and even in visual terms, he's, he still is uh, so intent on uh, giving his all and giving his full respect to those traditions. So it's really wonderful to hear him talk about that. And they also talk about the, uh, the, the certain circumstances involved with uh, the studio wanting to get this film out quickly. Uh, and rather, and, and perhaps John Carpenter, uh, he expresses how he he wished that perhaps he might have, uh, he wished he had more money and more time to do a little bit more of what he wanted uh, with the film. And so, uh, but un, un, but uh, as it turned out, it was released uh, a little bit earlier than John Carpenter might have uh, wanted. But uh, it was beyond his control, and to, to sort of make matters uh, even more sort of complicated, uh, it was released in April 1995, and this is around the time of in the United States uh, the the, uh, the very uh, terrible uh, Oklahoma City bombing, and so uh, the Sandy King was talking about how uh, that. Uh, the, that very terrible event in U.S. history was, uh, of course, uh, a very, uh, very much in uh, everyone's consciousness at the time of um, marketing and promoting this particular film, Village of the Damned. And so that was, I think, one example of how the ultimate launch of the film and the ultimate reception of the film upon its release might have been affected in a negative way. Uh, but uh, I. I do also appreciate the fact that uh, John Carpenter f films, and including this one, uh, do have legs and they do uh, have longevity even after their release and they tend to grow in stature uh, as time passes. And uh, I, I like how the, the documentary suggests this. And 
and gives this film a, a kind of new lease on life for those of us who might not necessarily look at it as uh, the the pinnacle of John Carpenter's work. Uh, this documentary is a must-watch, and it's it's uh, uh, very very important in the context of uh, evaluating and reevaluating the film *Village of the Damned*. In my opinion, so this is the documentary. It takes a village. Then there is a second supplement which is called Horrors Hallowed Ground. This is about 20 minutes and this is with Sean Clark. So Sean Clark does a lot of these horror hallowed ground supplements for uh, other films where he tr visits the actual locations where the films were shot. And in this case he was visiting uh, parts of Northern California like uh, Inverness, California, uh, Point Reyes, California, etc. And just telling us exactly wh what was shot where and giving us those great details. There's one moment where um, uh, I don't want to get too much into detail in the film, but uh, it's not necessarily a spoiler to say that there's one moment where there's a road and there's a, a bit of, a, of white paint that's on the road. And in fact, when he visits that location where that particular scene was shot, uh, it, it was about 20 years after the fact, you could still see a bit of the white paint on the road, and that's a really awesome detail. Uh, so... There's something else on the road, too. It, it's a little bit of a comic thing, uh, but I'll leave it to you to watch that particular documentary and check that out. It, it's fantastic. Also, I should say that uh, Sean Clark's documentary reminds us uh, wonderfully how this film, in terms of its use of locale and environment and setting, uh, is a direct... Uh, it's directly related also to John Carpenter's earlier film, The Fog, uh, in terms of uh, almost exact uh, uses of some of the same locations and also the, f the familiarity of the environment and the setting, you know, this Northern California uh, seaside feel to it almost. It, it's, it's, it was present in the fog and it's certainly present here in Village of the Damned. And so to watch Son Clark's documentary uh, is a really great reminder of, of yet another link that exists uh, between an earlier John Carpenter work and this one. So uh, highly recommend it as always. And also there's a great, uh, there's uh, uh, Skip Richardson, uh, who uh, was uh, part of the actual law enforcement of the town at the time, and he also features in the film in a very... Uh, it's kind of a small, but it's still a very crucial role in the film. He's also uh, uh, interviewed in this particular documentary, and it's a very warm, uh, friendly interview. So, uh, once again, uh, this is all very much worth uh, checking out. And then there's a third supplement, which is Splendid absolutely splendid. It's called The Go-To Guy, and this is a 45-minute or so interview with the one and only Peter Jason. Now, if you know John Carpenter's works, you will recognize the name Peter Jason, and uh, that is because he has appeared in so many John Carpenter films, and in fact, this 45-minute uh, interview with Peter Jason has him talking in, in great detail about each of the films that he uh, that he appeared in for John Carpenter and the circumstances for his appearance in those films and some anecdotes or onset little stories that he has about some of the the production history of the films. So, if you are a fan of John Carpenter films, this particular interview, I would say, is a must-watch. This is a must-see interview. Uh, Peter Jason's uh, importance in the world of John Carpenter, in particular the latter half of John Carpenter's career, uh, is, uh, is so great and it's so immense that anything he has to say is, I think, very important. And the way he delivers it as well, he is so he he, he laughs. He has this this wonderful, uh, wonderful laugh that makes you just happy to listen to anything he has to say. And I also like his frankness. He's very frank about a lot of the production details uh, of about some of the films that he's uh, talking about. Of course, he's talking about Prince of Darkness, They Live. Um, uh, in the Mouth of Madness, a Village of the Damned, Escape from L.A., Ghosts of Mars, uh, Body Bags as well, um, and uh, and uh, you know his overall career with Carpenter, uh, and in particular with Village of the Damned, he he goes into very frank detail about how s there was uh, one particular actor uh, he 
he doesn't name this particular actor, but you can kind of tell who he's talking about in, in his description of the situation, but how this particular actor wasn't, uh, uh, in one particular instance only, uh, the actor uh, had trouble remembering some of the dialogue. And so that was the one, one of the only few times that he saw Carpenter a little bit, not necessarily, uh, he, he, he saw Carpenter say, oh, please remember your lines or something. It wasn't a fight or anything like that, but it was just one of those occasions where he saw Carpenter just uh, give a little little bit of, uh, of uh, constructive feedback to one of his actors as well. He also has a, a very interesting story about, uh, again, he has nothing but great things to say about Christopher Reeve as well, but there's, um, as with any kind of film shoot, sometimes uh, there can be a little bit of disagreement sometimes, and, and Peter Jason isn't suggesting that Christopher Reeve and, and John Carpenter had a falling out or anything. No, not in the slightest. I think he's suggesting that they had overall a really great working relationship. But he's saying that like with any working relationship, um, you know, you know it, it's it's not uncommon to have a little bit of a disagreement. And so he was re uh, recounting one disagreement that the two people had and just how Peter Jason himself was was uh, instrumental in uh, in in having the two of them uh, make amends, and so they can uh, uh, continue working on the film. And so that is a really uh, interesting uh, little bit of information because we don't get anything like that in the documentary. Um, you know, John Carpenter and Sandy King are are very uh, very professional and very almost diplomatic in terms of how they talk about uh, the production uh, in in very glowing terms and very warm welcoming terms. Uh, Peter Jason. Is, is giving us a frank, honest assessment, uh, but still being very respectful, very caring about the memory of Christopher Reeve and and how great he was on this set and and how professional he was, etc. So, uh, but to hear this a little one story uh, about this uh, the production, I think is again another fascinating aspect to this already fascinating interview. And he has similar uh, uh, stories like that about all the films that he worked on. You should hear his story uh, about body bags and how he ended up working on the film Body Bags. And he also tells the story about how he got the red Cadillac that ended up uh, in the film Body Bags and how it belonged to Orson Welles and how um, uh, Peter Jason, who, was, who made an appearance in the in the film uh, The Other Side of the Wind, uh, needed to get paid. And so... Uh, the, and, and so uh, he, he went to Orson Welles to basically to ask to get paid. And so uh, through that, uh, there was a, uh, he ended up getting a Cadillac. So it, that you should listen to the story and how he tells it because it is really a great, great story, um, as well as the rest of the stories had, that he tells. Once again, if you are a fan of Carpenter Works and or if you are a fan of Peter Jason films, this, uh, this d interview is essential absolutely essential. So this is the go-to guy. It's 45 minutes, it's long, and it's great. Every single minute of it is great. Um, and um, then there are uh, vintage interviews and uh, uh, behind-the-scenes footage in one supplement that's about 24 minutes in total. And we have uh, interviews that were made at the time with John Carpenter and Christopher Reeve and Christy Alley and Linda Kozlowski and Mark Hamill and even Wolf Rilla, uh, the director of the original 1960 work. And so, uh, and then we have by, behind the scenes footage of John Carpenter uh, with uh, particular scenes involving Christy Alley and Christopher Reeve, for example. We see him working with the children. Uh, there's a particular scene where he's trying to direct the children in and around the barn. He's also seen directing uh, scenes around the barn in, in terms of of, uh, of certain uh, uh, sort of action set pieces as well. So uh, and and the like and the interviews as well are, are really great. They go into a lot of detail and a lot of almost spoilery detail. And so uh, I would always recommend that. Uh, you watch the film first and then you watch the, the supplements. But in particular with these vintage interviews, they're great. They're really great, don't get me wrong. But they do go into a lot of detail about the endings of certain things, what happens to certain characters and the like. And so I would recommend watching the, the film first and then um, uh, just going into the, these vintage interviews because they are really, really great. Um, and then there is a... 
Uh, there's a theatrical trailer and there is a photo gallery. Uh, it's about 24, 25 pictures, if, I, if I'm uh, not mistaken, around that number anyway. And it's one of these photo galleries where you can push the forward button. It'll direct you to the next photo and the next photo uh, and the like. And so that's uh, really nice to have. Uh, and that, my friends, rounds out the supplements that can be found on this particular Scream Factory, Shout Factory, Blu-ray, Region A. Uh, once again, highly recommended. Okay, my friends, so with that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about this film a little bit in more detail. And so I will be talking about spoilers. And so if you haven't seen the film yet, please uh, uh, turn off this video and watch this film. Once again, it's a pretty intense, violent film, so if you're if that's not your cup of tea, uh, please don't uh, feel the need to have to watch uh, this film. But if you are okay with uh, intense, uh, violent uh, sci-fi horror films, uh, then uh, I would recommend uh, watching this film. Again, it's a, a I, th I think it's a really prime example of John Carpenter's 90s output. And it's another remake that he does really, really well uh, under the circumstances. So I strongly recommend it, uh, once again, if this kind of film is your cup of tea. So uh, uh, if you haven't seen the film, um, please be sure to watch it first, and then you can come back to this video at any time, and at which time it would be my pleasure to hear your thoughts about this film, John Carpenter's Village of the Damned. Okay, so you're back, my friends, which means uh, that you have seen the film Village of the Damned, I can assume. And I must repeat again that I think that this film is a really, really good and powerful, edgy film. It is, uh, it is up there with some of John Carpenter's most effective works, in my opinion. And I feel this way because of the way it's shot and the way it uh, portrays the intensity and the way it uh, pre uh, presents the information and heightens the tension and creates this sense of, of really palpable unease, uh, and which is really nicely delineated from the first half of the film all the way to the second half of the film. And uh, the, the tension, of course, comes with the, the narrative of these children who have these uh, highly, uh, they're highly intelligent and they also have these psychic powers and the the more that we get to know them, the more they real, we realize that they are very, very dangerous uh, to the point where they can be described as being evil, at least uh, most of them anyway, maybe all except for one, but even the one that I'm referring to, David, uh, and there's still a little bit of ambiguity by the film's end. But uh, uh, needless to say, though, that these children are the antagonists. They are the villains of the film. And so it's up to the townspeople, uh, led by Christopher Reeve's character, Linda Kozlowski's character, and also uh, someone who's not part of the town, but also is, is someone who is uh, essentially from the government, uh, Christy Alley, uh, Dr. Werner and uh, their efforts, and as well as other people from the town, Mark Hamill's character, etc., um, uh, and, and trying to essentially stop this menace, uh, these basically evil children uh, who have this uh, really frightening power that they use to uh, take over the minds of people and essentially uh, have them kill themselves or get into really gruesome accidents. Uh, and w we see the film depict uh, many of these accidents. Uh, some of them are depicted quite graphically and uh, quite shockingly, but then others are depicted in a way that uses the power of imagination more than the use of special effects. Uh, and that's what I mean when I say that this film is, I think, uh, shot and, and it presents information in a really effective way because it's not an over and it's not an overly abundant gore fest of a film. Uh, in fact, Greg Nicotero in one of the supplements uh, in the long documentary mentions this. He says you know, he, he's been working with Carpenter uh, in past projects, but this was the project that he worked on with Carpenter where he uh, relied on the least amount of special effects. Uh, relative to his other works, and I, I can see that. Of course, there are some gruesome makeup effects that are ap applied. You know, there's a shot of uh, a person who is burned to death on a on a uh, charcoal grill, 
uh, early in the film. There's also uh, the very gruesome death of the, the character played by Buck Flower, and he, he's uh, with the broom handle, uh, and, uh, and there's also a pretty gruesome death uh, near the end of the film involving immolation and that's shown on camera it's 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 very unsettling very very graphic but there are other uh, moments of violence on screen that are shown in a way that doesn't show the violence explicitly but it's just the the way in which it's presented it, it really is more shocking uh, due to the fact that it's relying on our imaginations which is a very powerful tool indeed but in fact what's shown on screen is is very uh, it's it's very uh, restrained. Um, I would uh, uh, draw your attention, for instance, to the Mark Hamill character and what happens to him at the end there. Also, what happens to the Christie Alley character uh, at the end. Uh, and uh, you know, in both instances, they're really shocking moments because uh, the 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 deaths of these characters comes in a very uh, unpleasant and unsettling way. In particular, the Christie Alley character, the Doctor Werner character, that is one of the most uh, unsettling moments of the. Film film. Even now when I think about it, I'm, I, I cringe because it's really, really disturbing. Uh, but uh, it's shot in a way that it, it doesn't show any kind of graphic, uh, special effect uh, driven violence on screen, but it's all reaction and intensity and uh, uh, the sound effect design and the, the children and their eyes and the chilling factor and the close up on Christie's Alley's face and w the pain and, and sorrow and uh, re almost tragedy that uh, is registered uh, that she shows in her, her visage. It's just, uh, it's all, all these elements. So. This is my way of suggesting that this is a film that is not overly uh, reliant on the special effects extra extravaganza uh, part of the horror genre. That's not to say that special effects are bad, of course, if they're done well and they're done so artfully and skillfully, like we've seen in many past John Carpenter films like The Thing, etc., then they can become great uh, works of art. Uh, in the cinematic form. But there are other ways to express horror in cinema and sometimes uh, it's sometimes a film that expresses horror but done in a way that is also uh, uh, sometimes or for the most part restrained in terms of the use of, of graphic effects is also very effective and I think this is a film that uh, feels that way in its uh, in the way it's presenting uh, presenting its information and presenting its story, which is really fascinating from my point of view because I always feel that this film is more violent on screen than it actually is. Don't, don't get me wrong, it's still a very violent film, but it always I always remember this film being more violent than it actually is, and I think that is due to the fact that it really is a very unsettling work. It is very unsettling, um, and the way it... it it suggests violence uh, is also very unsettling. And I, I point your attention once again to the Kirstie Alley scene that I was referring to just a moment ago. And so uh, this is to say that I think John Carpenter's craft here is really, uh, it's, it's just uh, on all thrusters. And he is uh, showing his ability to scare and frighten uh, with uh, relatively little shown on screen, and I think that is extraordinary. Again, it's just another example of the greatness of John Carpenter's craft uh, and the way that this film presents information, and it feels more violent than it actually is, at least explicitly anyway. Uh, but what it, it engenders in the imagination is so frightening, and so uh, even now that I think about it, really uh, very disturbing. Uh, and I, I find this film, therefore, to be an effective John Carpenter thriller and chiller. Uh, and even uh, this is a film that I was trying to suggest earlier has many connections with a, uh, a sort of cinematic past. And we've seen this a lot with John Carpenter's works before, but here, again, is no exception. So, of course, we have the connections with uh, John Wyndham and we have the connection with the 1960 Wolf Rilla film. Uh, and there are many similarities between those earlier works and this uh, this remake. Uh, I, it's not the point of this video to try to make a, a shot by shot or analysis, comparative analysis between this work and the other works. Uh, but let me just say very generally that there are 
a lot of similarities with, let's say, the 1960 or the earlier 1960 film, but there are some key differences as well. And uh, the key differences uh, are, for example, the way in which the children are depicted, uh, in particular the the Mara character and the David character and also how the ending plays out. There's, uh, it's more or less the same, but there are uh, some uh, subtle yet critical differences as well. And the, the, the way that the film plays out in, in other aspects too, there are some uh, similarities and yet some subtle yet critical differences. It's all to say that it, this is, I think, still a loving homage to the 1960 underlying work. And uh, I, I must say also that in the supplements for the Shout Factory release, it's really wonderful to see John Carpenter give so much respect and so much awe and go out of his way to invite Wolf Rilla and his wife to the location in Northern California as they were filming the film. And there's one moment in, I think, the vintage interviews uh, behind the scenes section of the supplements where we actually see John Carpenter and Wolf Rilla at sh uh, on uh, location as they're filming it's like the riot scene at night toward the end of the film people have torches and everything and trying to confront some of the children who are in the street um, and uh, Wolf Rilla is looking through the, the camera sitting he's next to John Carpenter but Wolf Rilla doesn't, is standing John Carpenter does such a gentlemanly thing he says why don't you sit down and Wolf Rilla says oh, it's okay I don't want to do that, that it's, that's such a beautiful moment between two artists of cinema um, and it, it's again a, an example of how I think John Carpenter is really trying to uh, give as much respect uh, that is uh, due to the, the underlying works. And so uh, this is, a, again, another example of John Carpenter's uh, uh, real endeavors to try to make and forge links to a cinematic past. I also mentioned uh, how John Carpenter mentions John Ford, and I think that's a really apt uh, description. Uh, John Ford is, is of course, I think, a, a connection that's made here. And Hitchcock, too, is a connection that's made here. Again, the setting with Northern California and a horror that's set in sort of isolation, which uh, is very reminiscent of something like The Birds. Uh, and also John Ford, in terms of shooting these natural vistas of the environment, uh, almost uh, in a way that's both beautiful and also a way that uh, focuses one's, intention, uh, one's attention on the, the isolating nature of the vastness of the environment. And I think there is a lot to be said about how the environment is shot uh, in this particular film and the depiction of, of this uh, small, small town of Midwich as this place that's almost isolated from the rest of the world. And in fact, that's one of the key points of the film because the reason why uh, we assume this is due to some kind of uh, maybe alien or extraterrestrial or other dimensional beings that have come perhaps to to uh, various points in the world that are isolated, uh, that are in small towns and has essentially um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, impregnated uh, a number of the citizenry uh, in these particular towns. And the point is that the, the point of commonality is that each of these places around the world, according to the Christie Alley character, is isolated. And so uh, this idea of shooting a, a, an environment that's isolated and recalling John Ford, who does a similar thing with his own camera, capturing the majesty and the isolation all at once, I think is a wonderful connection that John Carpenter's making. It ties so well, not it to ties so well into the narrative and also ties in so beautifully to John Carpenter's craft and his, uh, his almost uh, uh, philosophy as a cinematic artist. Uh, and not only do we see John Carpenter tying to making ties to a cinematic past, we also see John Carpenter making ties to his own filmography. As we have seen in many of his other films, he makes links back to his own films. Uh, the, the most striking uh, links, I think, with respect to Village of the Damned, I think, are the two films, one being The Thing, and the fact that the Village of the Damned is a remake, the same way like The Thing was a remake. Uh, and so uh, we have remakes that are trying to do things with the underlying film, but we know that The Thing, it's more complicated than that in both instances because they're not necessarily remakes in the sense that re they're remaking uh, the underlying, f uh, the earlier film, but they're also reinterpretations or reimaginings uh, in the sense of the underlying source material. And so uh, I think there's a little bit of, of uh, 
of, of that kind of complexity in terms of the art of the adaptation uh, in Village of the Damned and the thing. I think there is a little bit of a different kind of mechanism at play here because I think the production details ultimately are a little bit different f uh, between Village of the Damned and the thing. Nonetheless, there is the same kind of artistic thrust, let me put it that way. And so uh, while the circumstances are different, and I don't want to suggest that they are both uh, in, in equal measures anyway, remakes uh, in the broad sense of that term, I do want to suggest that they do fit into this particular, let's say, niche in terms of John Carpenter's filmography. And they do provide a very uh, uh, interesting and unique uh, modern takes on a, an already existing storyline, let me put it that way. I should point out too that there's an interesting uh, comparison point in that uh, respect between Village of the Damned and The Thing. But also, as I was saying earlier, I think that this film is is much more uh, it, it feels much more violent than it actually is, uh, and so uh, when I examine this film, I, I notice that uh, a lot of its violent scenes. Um, are very restrained in terms of the minimal use, use of special effects, whereas The Thing is quite the opposite. It's, the, un, it's on the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of showing a lot. But I think the effects are, are uh, the effect on the viewer is very similar. And so it's interesting to see, on the one hand, these films are similar in terms of their remake status, but they are also different in terms of the approach to horror. But I would also argue that uh, either approach is uh, very respectable and also uh, very much... Um, uh, full of possibilities in terms of the overall effects that can be had on the viewers' minds. So that's one link to John Carpenter's past that I think is very important. The other link is to The Fog, John Carpenter's The Fog, uh, because of the setting, because of the in fact that the, the settings, the locations uh, are uh, uh, almost the same. Uh, for some key shots in particular, it's 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 uh, exactly the same. You know, there's a, one particular stretch of street in in the town where uh, it wasn't. It, it was the street where uh, we see the Mark Hamill character looking as some uh, ambulance car drives down the road. It's also the same stretch of street where uh, Tom Atkins and Jamie Lee Curtis were driving or in the truck trying to escape from the fog, etc. So we have these similar similar types of of visual cues that tie the two films together. There's also this element of this uh, Northern California, uh, quiet, uh, small town feel that is under a, a large and uh, supernatural uh, menace, if you will. Uh, and I think we see this at play both in, in, in both films, uh, and it leads to a, a climax that really affects a wide range of characters in both instances. Uh, so there, there is a, a linkage between those two films, I think, and that it makes actually uh, The Fog and Village of the Damned, I think, a really interesting double feature, uh, in case you're interested. So, uh, in other words, John Carpenter, even now, is still uh, working with uh, tying in to uh, many of, of his past films and so therefore this, fi this film fits in so neatly and so well into the overall uh, filmography context of John Carpenter's works. Uh, and even in the themes that, are, that we see in this film, I think that we can also find a lot of similarity and a lot of consistency in the kinds of uh, themes that John Carpenter as an artist seems to be interested in. Uh, we have this idea of, of emotional cores that form the heart of these otherwise uh, uh, horror films or, or hardcore science fiction films uh, and the like. Uh, you know, the, it's always about the characters for John Carpenter's films, uh, even when the characters are set against the backdrop of some really uh, uh, unbelievable imaginative uh, imaginative one-of-a-kind spectacle. Uh, it's always about uh, you know the Kurt Russell character in, in Escape from New York, or it's, it's about the, the relationship between the uh, the main characters in Big Trouble in Little China, or it's the emotional relationship um, uh, uh, you know in Christine or in Starman. Uh, and this film, Village of the Damned, is no different uh, because uh, I would say that. Um, uh, you know, it, well, it's 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 very similar in that the emotional core comes from the relationships, in particular, uh, the Linda Kozlowski character, and also the the uh, Christopher Reeve character. And the Christopher Reeve character. Well, let's talk about the Linda Kozlowski character because uh, the the key relationship that she has in the film uh, is that with her son David. Uh, and uh, this is the the one of this is the only uh, member of the child group. 
that doesn't have a pair because uh, the, the, the girl that was meant to be David's pair or David's partner, if you will, uh, did not survive. And so uh, he is left as the only single non-paired child in this group. It's a group of nine where it should have been a group of ten, right? So, uh, and that seems to be uh, it, the film seems to be suggesting that that makes him, for whatever reason, more human and more susceptible to human emotions than the rest of the group, uh, who seem to be very cold and very calculating, as uh, personified most by the leader of the group, Mara, who's very, very chilling, very, very effective. Um, uh, but the relationship between um, uh, Linda Kozlowski uh, and um, uh, the David character, uh, her son, uh, is really important because it's that emotional resonance that compels her to want to rescue him at the end. And it's that uh, sense of being a mother uh, that uh, really compels her to save him uh, from the, 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 the explosion that will, uh, we assume, uh, kill the rest of the children. And so... Uh, but it leads to, of course, a, a kind of uh, ambiguous ending because we're left wondering whether indeed David, the young boy who survived, will indeed be a, a peaceful, uh, loving child or maybe he will uh, harbor the same similar sinister instincts that the rest of his brethren uh, seem to exhibit during the film. And then that uh, ends the film in a very... Uh, potentially dark and ambiguous way. But uh, once again, I want to suggest that it's the emotional core of the characters that leads uh, the character, the, the mother character, to compel herself to want to, to rescue the child. And so that, that forms one emotional basis of the film. And the other emotional basis is, of course, uh, Christopher Reeve and uh, the fact that he loses his wife um, and the fact that he seems to be very much on edge. He is stressed out. Um, he doesn't uh, seem to be liking his particular position. And the, the more as the, as the film progresses, the more on edge and uh, the more uh, steeped in paranoia he seems to be. As is the point where he takes uh, matters into his own hands and uh, essentially um, uh, sacrifices himself uh, in order to rid uh, the world of this terrible, terrible menace of these children with the very famous scene at the end in the barn and the and the you know you're thinking of a brick wall which is very famous it's, of course it's it's uh, borrowed of course from the the earlier works um, but uh, that is also a very interesting uh, f a flash of emotion because there's one particular instance if you recall uh, around the the latter half of the film where Christopher Reeves is in the barn with the children and he's talking uh, with Mara and and there is a, a bit of a confrontational uh, dialogue between the two characters. Mars is more and more asserting her authority in a very frightening way. And then suddenly, uh, almost inexplicably, we see Christopher Reeve uh, just stand there uh, and he's all got this uh, unusual peaceful look on his face and we realize that he's thinking of the ocean. And this is the, the little trick that he know, that he realizes that can trick the children into blocking uh, them from from reading his thoughts and reading his minds. And later on, we, he reveals that that particular moment is, a, is something that uh, he and his now late wife would do. They would uh, uh, look at the ocean and think about the future and think about themselves. And it, it's, it's in essence an image and a representation of how much he loved his now deceased wife. And so uh, that is a kind of emotional resonant moment that compels him to commit the final act that he does. And so uh, the film, I want to suggest in these two important ways, promotes and propels its, its narrative forward with uh, emotionally resonant reasoning. Uh, as exemplified by the example set by the Linda Kozlowski character and also the Christopher Reeve character as the two prime examples. And so I think this is very consistent with John Carpenter's filmography uh, up to now. And uh, I, I really admire that because it means that character development is king. And I, 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 uh, we see, we've seen this in many instances in John Carpenter's uh, filmography past, and it's, it's really uh, resonant and at play in this particular film, Village of the Damned. I also want to say that the story has a lot of uh, great twists to it. I mean, I don't mean narrative twists, but I mean ways in which expectations are defied. 
and I, I really admire that. You know, we've seen films in the past by John Carpenter that tend to defy expectations of the genre. Uh, examples I would cite immediately are films like Prince of Darkness. Uh, that seems to defy certain genre expectations very successfully, I would say. Uh, also very successfully defying exp genre expectations is a film like In the Mouth of Madness. Uh, here in Village of the Damned, I say that uh, while there is a, a plot thread that is more or less in tune with a story that we are more or less familiar with, uh, assuming that we know the underlying uh, uh, works that this film was based on, uh, but there is, there are some moments uh, where the film turns in a way that is refreshingly unexpected. And let me give you two examples of that. So first is uh, the Mark Hamill character, the priest. And the second is the Kirstie Alley character, the, the government official, the government doctor, Dr. Werner. And so uh, in a lot of these films, one would expect the... Uh, or the possibility anyway that, for instance, the priest character or the religious character might end up becoming overly zealous and uh, overly reliant on the religious zealotry to the point of becoming a kind of antagonist figure in the film, uh, someone who is uh, maybe consumed with paranoia or something to the point uh, of, of wanting con to control the, the society or something like that. Um, but we get none of that kind of, of development uh, in that particular direction of his character. On the contrary, his character is very much uh, it, it's it's sort of the theological basis of the film of course but uh, there's a, a certain a kind of warmth to his character as well so for example we see how the Mark Hamill character uh, interacts with uh, Melanie um, uh, the Meredith uh, Salinger character uh, in a very comforting way uh, we also see uh, him uh, interact with uh, Linda Kozlowski's character in the film and and there is a certain sense of urgency and he realizes he's part of the community and he is as much a victim as everyone else in the community and he tries to put things in his uh, tries to stop things uh, uh, on his own uh, unsuccessfully unfortunately for him um, because uh, the children get wind of what it is he's trying to do and they they retaliate accordingly but uh, he, that is an example of where his character is not uh, it doesn't go in a certain genre expectation way that one would otherwise expect. The same kind of thing happens with the Kirstie Alley character, the Dr. Werner character, because she represents the government. She represents a kind of wanting to uh, get at the scientific bases and want to study these children, perhaps. And maybe that might suggest in in the same kind of film that uh, her character would end up being its own antagonist to the rest of the film. Maybe she would be antagonistic towards the community. Maybe she would want to study the, the alien life, whatever they were. Maybe she would want to protect them instead of wanting to kill them. You know, that kind of genre expectation. But no, what it actually happens is, well, of course, her character is not necessarily part of the community. And there are moments where it seems like perhaps she is looking down on this small town community, etc. But ultimately, she does show signs of, of uh, compassion and also caring and uh, wanting to help. I mean, the, one of her last moments is w warning uh, Christopher Reeve's character to get out because of, of news that she's got wind of about how the government is probably going to try to destroy the town and things like that. And so uh, there is a sense of compassion to her character and, and she ends up not being a villain in the piece. Maybe there are moments when she is slightly an antagonistic to the whole proceedings. I'll give you that, but she is not a villain. And I, I find that uh, that is an unexpected turn, that is a really refreshing turn uh, that the film takes. And so I, uh, I, I, I find that this kind of defiance of genre expectations is something that we have seen in other John Carpenter films. And I think this film is yet another example of that. And it's done really well and, and quite effectively. And in terms of uh, overall themes that this film talks about, uh, this is a film that uh, is, I think, uh, one of the, the core themes of it is uh, the, the notion of parenthood, and in particular, the notion of motherhood. Uh, the first half of the film 
we don't even get the children. Uh, I mean, we get the 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 fact the, the whole storyline of the people passing out at the same time and the town being uh, engulfed in this kind of unknown phenomena. And uh, suddenly, the the um, uh, a number of people uh, have are, are found to be uh, expecting at the same time, and uh, they give birth to the children all at the same time. And uh, along the way, we see the concerns that many of these women have, how this. Uh, this situation has affected them personally in their own particular ways. Uh, you know, with the, uh, the everything that, for instance, with the Ben, the Peter Jason character, and and that particular storyline, uh, and also with the Linda Kosowski character and uh, um, uh, her husband and what happens to him very early on, quite unexpectedly, quite tragically, and also a similar parallel situation with Christopher Reeve and his wife and what happens uh, to that storyline, and also the young uh, young woman, uh, uh, Melanie, uh, who and and her particular storyline and, and how she's trying to deal with with this, and then this is also uh, further augmented when the children are born, and and uh, the, after the and. The uh, the way in which these mothers are trying to deal with their particular situations after this particular point in time, and it's all quite different, um, and they each have a different uh, a conclusion to that particular storyline. Uh, the main characters, anyway. So let's, uh, you know, the Melanie character, of course, uh, reaches her end uh, relatively early in a very unfortunate, tragic circumstance, um, and and her storyline is, of course, a little bit different than the others because of the fact that uh, her child died. Um, and uh, but it actually is a little bit more complicated than that, as we find out later in the film and Kirstie Alley and what she actually did with the child. But um, but the, her story ends in a certain way, and then the Linda Koslovsky character with her son David ends in a certain way. And of course, we have Christopher Reeve and uh, his wife and what happens to her around the middle of the film in a very tragic, sad moment. And then it leads into the second half of the film where we have the children and then the storyline involving them and the relationships, of course, that are, uh, uh, that are further explored in terms of parent, children, mothers, and, and child, etc. So uh, this film is, I think, really about the relationship, um, exploring that notion of, of the anxiety of, of parenthood, the, the, the sorts of uh, uh, natural, instinctual feelings of, of uh, maybe uh, 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 I don't know if fear is the right word, but there is there's a kind of a natural sense of nervousness one feels uh, with respect to one's children. You know, we want ch our children to grow up uh, healthy, and we want them, them to grow up uh, in, a, in a healthy environment, etc. So it's very scary uh, from the point of view of a parent to wonder if, uh, you know, uh, there is anything wrong with our children. And it's also even scary to think that perhaps... Uh, there is something quite sinister uh, going on with respect to our children. So these sorts of themes, I think, go at, a, at the very heart of this uh, general sense of uh, the ex exploration of parenthood, and in particular in the context of horror films. So it, it's it's really quite uh, quite a, 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 a interesting exploration of this theme in Village of the Damned. If I had to say one thing about this theme, I, I'd say that there's a lot of emphasis on mothers and children, and perhaps uh, maybe less emphasis on fathers and children. Um, you know, there's less emphasis for instance, on how the, uh, the, the Peter Jason character or the uh, Mark Hamill character or the Christopher Reeve character, how they regard their roles as fathers in this, uh, in this particular situation. They, we do still see them re, uh, interacting with the children, don't get me wrong, but there, I would say that there's less of an emphasis placed on the father-child relationship uh, rather than the mother-child relationship. And in particular, the first half of the film deals, I think, with the mother-child relationship very effectively and, and quite, uh, quite eerily. Uh, and maybe less so with the father-child relationship. But I think we can forgive the film for that particular point because by the time we reach the second half, I think the, the other themes and other, uh, narrative, uh, uh, other narrative concerns come into play because the children are now, uh, they are now older and uh, they become much more uh, active and much more violent in terms of their, their ever-growing powers and so. so uh, but uh, granted, this is, I think, one very important theme of the film. 
And another very important theme of the film, I think, is is one that we've seen in other John Carpenter films, which is that of paranoia. Uh, the theme of paranoia, the theme of of, of uh, not knowing, uh, not being sure, uh, not having control. And I think this uh, is expressed very clearly in the fact that the children take control of the minds and, and actions of these people. And as they're under control, they they almost know that they're under control, but they have no way of stopping it. So that's why you see these really uh, almost you can sense the, the the fright in these people as they are being controlled against their will uh, to their impending doom. We see this with Peter Jason. We see this with Kirstie Alley. We see this with Mark Hamill. We see this with. Uh, 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 Buck Flower, and we see this with uh, with other people who are under the mind control. The kids under these really frightening and and, and terrible, uh, gruesome scenes. Uh, so uh, there's this. I think that is very suggestive of the idea of paranoia, of not knowing, of not having a sense of control, and uh, the fright that is generated from that particular state of paranoia. And of course, we have seen John Carpenter in his past films deal with this idea of paranoia in different modes, in different contexts. I grant you that, but still, uh, we see it in They Live. We see it in uh, The Thing. Uh, we see it in the in the mouth of madness, etc. Uh, and so uh, this is again continuing that uh, tradition of John Carpenter's treatment of the theme of paranoia in cinema. And I think it's a very fine treatment. It's a very frightening treatment, and it's as I say and suggest a quite a, an effective, chilling one indeed. Uh, so in that respect, and in all other respects that I try to explain now, uh, this is uh, very much consistent with John Carpenter's filmography. And I should end also with uh, some d just some details that I find particularly memorable about this film. I think the whole uh, uh, design and the makeup and the whole look of the kids I think is really, really uh, interesting and fascinating. Uh, there's a, a kind of monochromatic look to them in that uh, I think they're meant to have blonde hair, but it's in fact not even blonde hair. It's more of a whitish color and their clothes are gray or drab or white or something like that. So they are almost uh, being depicted in a kind of black and white fashion which is very similar to how they were depicted in, in the earlier 1960 film, right? Because that was in black and white. So there's a kind of a visual cue or callback to uh, the earlier black and white cinematic tradition when we see these kids. And I think that's really great. Um, of course, the look itself is very memorable and it's very eerie, very frightening. And the way that the kids move in unison and the way that they have a kind of walk to them, uh, even... Um, uh, 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 David um, and uh, uh, Thomas Decker, uh, the character, the actor who plays David uh, in the documentary on the Shout Factory release, he talks about how he had a little bit of a bouncy walk to his his uh, his his movements, which uh, he also explains that, that that actually adds a little bit of character to his his performance because it's a little bit unique and set off from the rest of the crew, uh, the rest of the kids, which are really much in unison and walking almost like a an army unit. Um, but not David. He has his own little. It, it's uh, he 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 follows uh, the beat of his own drummer, as it were. And so uh, I think that's a nice, also a nice little visual cue to see how, in fact, how independent he is and separate he is from the rest of the pack. Uh, but overall, I think the look is very effective, um, and uh, the uh, the the um, uh, the performances I think are very effective as well. Um, uh, 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 the uh, the Lindsay Hahn uh, performance as Mara I think is 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 great. Uh, she is really great and she's very commanding, uh, and she has to um, uh, say these lines with these really big words uh, for a, a little kid to say something like that very effectively. I think is really quite remarkable. In fact, she mentions that in the uh, in the documentary about how she was I think only about eight or nine and still she had to uh, say these lines with of dialogue which which had words that uh, are probably uh, uh, not always the easiest words to say for an eight or nine year old and she pulls it off really really well uh, and so commanding so frightening. Mara is one of those uh, this, one of the scariest characters in in uh, in any John Carpenter film 
and it's 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 uh, it's a, a great performance and also just the look of the the special effects and the way in which the eye color uh, changes it. that's one of the key iconic moments of this film uh, the images of the film the eye, the fact that the eye color changes as the kids are employing their their superpowers the way that the colors change from, I think it's like a green to an orange or to a bright red uh, and goes back and forth like that but mostly red uh, whenever they do a, a particularly nasty bit of violence uh, and uh, even at the end with uh, uh, their faces almost turning alien like to reveal their true uh, physical nature I think is a nice touch it, it's just enough to realize to make us realize that in fact they are indeed not of this earth um, and uh, the special effects too I, I I'm while I'm at the end I should say that the the last uh, moment the, the climax of the film uh, with the 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 brick wall and Christopher Reeve standing there and he's acting so intense and being attacked mentally uh, the way he is uh, it's the performance is brilliant the, the performance of the kids are brilliant uh, the way that uh, Linda Kozlowski and David also figure in into and add an extra element of complexity to this uh, final scene is also brilliant the way that the the brick wall itself is shot is brilliant the way that the case with the dynamite and the, and the ticking clock it, it's such a, a cinematically uh, n nonsensical way to uh, to pack the, 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 the bag like that but it makes sense in the cinema world you know it's the cinema grammar um, and uh, for this kind of genre film and so I, I love all of these aspects and that the tension is so tight so uh, it, it's so uh, unnerving uh, sweat inducing type of stuff and uh, so these elements I think uh, fall in line uh, to create a very uh, arresting and uh, scary, uh, scary work indeed. Uh, one that I think deserves more attention uh, than perhaps it has uh, gained over time. But it is still a relative, relatively new film. I not new, but it's still a relatively uh, recent film. Where it comes a little bit later in John Carpenter's filmography. So these films always take time to grow, uh, and uh, especially with the Scream Factory release, I think this film um, is given a lot of of love and attention and uh, hopefully with that love and attention that Scream Factory gives it uh, here in the Blu-ray I, uh, I hope it finds uh, a, a, as wide an audience as possible because I really think this film is a, a great example of John Carpenter's craft uh, and the way that he shoots horror and the way that he depicts horror and the way that he is restraining himself in many respects but also focusing in on, on elements of character and emotion to drive the story forward to its very exciting, very suspenseful conclusion. So it's all there in this form of horror entertainment from John Carpenter, Village of the Damned. Okay, my friends, so that's it for now. Uh, what do you think of this film? Do you like this film? Do you not like this film? Uh, please feel free to let me know what you think in the comment section below. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts. So, my friends, thank you very much for your time. And until we meet again, please be happy and healthy and well. And please keep on watching a lot of great, great movies. My friends, thank you very much for your time as always. And cheers. Thank you.